The wounded were lying on straw in open wagons with serious injuries. The officer in charge wanted to get his patients home. And we weren't allowed to let them move, even though we had locomotives available. We couldn't permit it. The order from above was no more trains homeward. Being a military railwayman under the control of the Red Army, we received orders direct from the chief military command. They sent their orders to the railway directorate, who passed them on to us, the management of the group, and we provided engines for the army trains, the ones that had to go to the front. The famous German planning just hadn't worked because they hadn't thought about it. They'd, their assumptions were false. Uh, and their assumptions excluded railways as a primary means of supply, whereas the Russians knew damned well that they'd have to rely on railways, partly because they didn't have roads, let alone autobahns, so they knew they'd have to rely on them, which they did absolutely brilliantly. It was a turning point. As in 1914, Germany now faced a long, all-consuming war in which the railways would be crucial. Only now did railways become central to Germany's war effort. Even the design of engines was now adapted to the demands of war. The Kriegslok, or war locomotive, was a single simple design that could be mass produced. Yes, see, look at the boiler. It's all simplified. We didn't use any sheet metals, everything was reduced. Now, you had all these bars here. They're molded. Before, we would have polished them. Now, we just left them. Here, all the bearings are completely simplified. It's all one piece now, straight from the press works. We only needed to give it the finishing touches and assemble it. And the simple reason for doing this, less hours for production, less working hours, faster and more production to get the product out. It was all for the same end. Simplifications cut the time it took to build an engine by almost two-thirds and enabled the job to be done by unskilled workers, prisoners of war and forced labor. Not until 1942, several years after Britain, was Germany's economy fully mobilized for the war effort. Once again, war became a duel of industrial might. As the war persisted, many rail workers were sent to the front. Among those drafted to replace them was a teenage refugee from East Prussia, Gerda Schlotterbeck. It shocked me when I heard that I had to become a railway worker because I had no idea what to expect. All I knew was that trains ran on tracks with an engine at the front. I asked myself what I was supposed to do there. I didn't have a choice. You couldn't choose your occupation. You had to go where you were ordered to. And this is what I did. My father worked for the railway. He repaired tracks, the old wooden tracks that had to be repaired for the war because of the heavy usage. He was a very small man and he had to carry the rails. We were put together in groups of Jewish male workers. We had to carry these potato bags, reload them into vans and send them to other stations. It was at the Stettin station. Hard work, very hard work.
The Holocaust really got underway at the same time as the war became total for Germany. That is, in the middle of 1941, when they invaded. From this time on, it was no longer a luxury war. It was a life-to-death war for existence. And under those circumstances, the limits of what you could do, even in Nazi Germany, even to Jews, fell away. Before that, the Germans were concerned to not to antagonize their own people, whereas under circumstances of total war, as three and a half million uh, German troops battled against uh, the Soviet army, as millions and millions of Germans died, 80% of all Germans who died in World War II died in the, on the Soviet front, as their own cities, of course, were being bombed to smithereens, you could do anything. The Berlin suburb of Grunewald is one of the smartest in the city. But during the war, it was from this station that most of the remaining Jews in Berlin were transported by rail to the concentration camps. 50,000 of them. Ja, es ist so schwer, mich nun umzudrehen und es zu zeigen, weil dann sehe ich. Yes, it is hard for me to turn around and show you this place because I can feel the despair again. To see friends arriving in open vans. And you know that there is a train waiting for them, a train of cattle trucks and goods wagons. Knowing what awaits them. Amazingly, many of them didn't realize what was going on. They allowed themselves to be fooled. The SS officers asked, please leave your luggage on the left of the platform. It will be collected by goods wagons. And they did so. Very disciplined and very willingly, so they wouldn't be burdened with it. They had no idea yet that there would be no space for luggage in the cattle wagons. There would be 80 people in each wagon. At that point, I served them soup. And I even met friends of mine. We'd nod and say, see you soon. And they had their soup, something warm to eat, the soup. Then I saw them being pushed inside. The possibilities of railways encouraged two fatal vanities among generals. The first is because they could move troops and supplies so relatively fast in such enormous quantities gave them a feeling of omnipotence, that they were chess players. The second, and allied to that, was that because of railways they could command their troops far from the battlefield. And this gave them a sense of unreality, which I think was an absolute disaster. Now, this feeling of omnipotence and this distancing reached a sort of tragic crescendo in the Holocaust, which, of course, would not have been possible without an extremely efficient railway system. And that is the most tragic and ironic link between railways and the capacity to distance yourself from events, which was one strand in the Holocaust because so few people needed to admit to themselves what they were doing. The surprising thing about the Holocaust is how easy it was. I'll give you some figures. Uh, six million people are supposed to have been killed in the Holocaust, including some members of my own family uh, from the Netherlands. Uh, out 
of those six million, probably two million or so were killed on the spot. The rest had to be transported to the various death camps first. Uh, a standard German military train of the time had 55 carriages. We mentioned this before. 50 persons per carriage, actually, you would get in more, but even if you take the standard figures, would be 2,500 persons per train. You could transport the whole 4 million people by this gruesome logic in about 1,600 trains. Uh, spread over a period of approximately three years from the end of 1941, which is when Auschwitz opened, to the end of 44, when it closed. Approximately one and a half trains a day. This at a time, as we said earlier, when the German forces in Russia alone required over a hundred trains a day in order to keep fully supplied. So, relatively speaking, killing six million people was an easy, very small job. This is one of the amazing things about it. To escape being transported himself, Gat Beck went underground. One refuge he used was the S-Bahn, Berlin's suburban rail network, where there were few Gestapo checks. This way, Beck was able to save himself and many others. Sehen Sie, da kommen wir zu einem Kapitel, wo wir der Reichsbahn banken müssen. Dass sie Züge auch während des Krieges. We had to be grateful to the railways that the trains ran all night during the war. Those who didn't have a place to hide, especially during summer, took an S-Bahn train to Wannsee. This is quite far away, a 45-minute ride. Sometimes you could stay on the train all the way to Erkner at the other end of the line. You could spend a huge amount of time doing this. Or you could sit at the station and eat sandwiches if there wasn't a train back right away. You could pretend to be a worker coming from a night shift, waiting for a train for another one, one and a half or two hours. Many people spent their nights like this. As the German war effort grew more and more dependent on rail transport, railways became a focus of active resistance. In occupied France, the Germans had come to rely heavily on the SNCF rail network. But it only took a few brave individuals to throw it into chaos. We didn't know at the beginning what we'd have to do. We didn't know there'd be parachute drops. We didn't know we'd have weapons and ammunition. It was quite complicated to start with. I kept this, which arrived in a parachute drop, in one of the British parachute drops. It's information on a greatly reduced card with instructions and the places where we had to perform acts of sabotage. It's written in English, it's minuscule, and it took a lot of patience to translate it and to see what it said, what the instructions were. Louis and Myro's Malat's target was this key depot in Avignon. In the run-up to D-Day in 1944, a campaign of railway sabotage was launched with coded signals broadcast by the BBC. 